children of history, man. No purpose or place. We have no great war, no great depression. Our great war is a spiritual war. Our great depression is our lives. Hey, right. Hey, come out. Right. Touch, man. Right. All right. All right. All right. Stuck left. Stuck left. Stand still, huh? Everybody. One o'clock. Oh. Good. 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 Twelve. Twelve. Oh. Five to three. I got mixed up. There's no way that you could have been as bad at hockey as you are at golf. All right, let's go. You like that, old man? You want a piece of me? I don't want a piece of you. I want the whole thing. Come on down for a pop in the chops. <laughs> Always with the violence. I'm Mark. I'm Tom. We are the, the Cinemaniacs. Cinemaniacs. Welcoming you and you and back you. after pretty close to a month off. It has been. That's uh, mostly my fault, probably. That's okay. But uh, we had some holidays, and then I was away taking my younger son to uh, a little camp that he's a study camp for the summer. Yeah. Not trying to get rid of him. But no, 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 no. And I was away, uh, a, a, a guest of the state. No, not true. Um, so, shall we jump right into we things? We probably should, because we've got, like you say, a month to catch up with. We have on. a month to catch up with. Uh, so I will begin in talking about a film. Now, here's the great thing. Can I do the intro without looking down to see what actually is the first film we're talking about? The answer would be no. Pardon me just a second. Okay, so here we have Christopher Nolan's epic tale of a, I don't want to say little known, but in terms of all the other battles, maybe to folks these days, a little known battle at the beginning of World War II uh, took place long ago on the shores of a little town called Dunkirk. <laughs> So this has been hyped up the... Sure has. Uh, this is one of those movies that I'm excited to see it because that means I don't have to watch the trailer anymore. <laughs> right. Got a lot of play out of this trailer. Uh, this is a film that apparently the ideal way to see this is in IMAX, like 70 millimeter so IMAX. This was shot in 65, yeah. So. And uh, not a lot of places can show it that way. I think I read only like 30 theaters in the, in the country can show it that way. And I've seen guides online to every different way you can see this and what, yeah. kind of, what form of image you're going to see and how much it's going to be cropped. And I'm like... Right. It starts to feel like work after a while. <laughs> uh, I'm not a huge fan of Nolan. I think he makes decent films. I didn't really care for the Batman movies, so okay. you know I don't have that going for me. Uh, not a major fan of war movies. They just have to be good movies. I don't. War is not a, a subject that draws me to it na naturally. Uh, but I thought this was good. It's uh, it's mostly just a big battle scene. It's right. about a hundred minutes, and you do not have a whole lot of setup. You sort of follow this one character to the point where he's trying to leave this battle scarred area that's under siege. And you, you bought between, I think, three or four different groups of people. There's right. uh, some civilians who have been could, hired or conscripted or whatever to take a private yacht to try to pick up some, some soldiers and get them out of there. You see Tom Hardy and another guy mm -hmm. in their Spitfire airplanes. You see this one guy trying to escape. And then you see the officers who are on deck trying to get all these men who are just standing in a, in a row waiting to get on a boat while they are constantly being bombarded by bombs and ships and machine gun fire and everything else. So it is an assault on the senses, certainly. Yep. Uh, it is it is gut-wrenching dread almost from the get-go. The, the, I realize that the score is pretty much constant in this film, and it's a, it is the kind that makes you sense dread even when there isn't any on screen. Yes. And then at even one like point, high-pitched, off-key oh, violin that just keeps grating. It's always something. And at yeah. one point, I think when all is well, the score stops, and you realize it, just because that's been working on you the whole time, when it right. stops, there's like this huge relief. You're like, hey, it's quiet now. <laughs> They're okay. Uh, the cast is strong. Not all faces you recognize. Right. I was impressed by the young One Direction, mm -hmm. uh, a young lad from One Direction who was fine as an actor in this movie. Sometimes yeah. they're not. Uh, somebody is an actor in another film we'll talk about who's a singer and well-known. Mm -hmm. Maybe not as good an actor as, the one, <laughs> as, as, as young Master Harry in this. Um, I saw this uh, locally at Keen Cinema, so that was just digital widescreen, right. you know, so I didn't get the full. The deal with, seven, with 70 millimeter, not much, much 70, but IMAX, is that it's, it's a tall image, so it's much more square than widescreen. Uh, so I believe those who have seen it in, in IMAX say it's much more immersive in all those se sequences where you're dive bombing and, and you know, Cinerama kind of stuff. 
uh, I don't want to blab too much because we have 45 movies to talk about <laughs> in 15 minutes. But uh, I thought Dunkirk was good. I did not think it was a masterpiece, but it held my interest the whole time. And I would certainly recommend it to people who are more interested in about that battle because it gives you, from what I hear, a pretty accurate sense of what it was like to be there. Right. And uh, people who want to see a whole lot of carnage and <laughs> gray, almost black and white dread for two hours. Um, I'll, I agree pretty much with everything you had to say. I thought this was good, not great. Um, we try, I think you and I both try to uh, watch as few, tra uh, few trailers as possible, listen to as little or as few reviews as possible before going in so we can really kind of fresh. I'd heard people saying this was the greatest movie ever made. And Whenever anybody says that about a new movie, I'm like, how many movies have you watched? Right, yeah, right, exactly. Yeah. That and Charlie and the Chocolate Factory or something. Yeah. Um, and so I don't know why I picked that one. Uh, so I went into this. I happen to like Nolan. Uh, I like uh, like the Batman movies and things, but I never thought of him as an actor's director, as a character-driven director. And this is really what uh, I took away from Dunkirk as being probably its strongest suit. I certainly had not known, uh, I'm not a history buff by any means, uh, for playing Trivial Pursuit, don't ask me history or geography, um, but I didn't know anything about the, the Battle of Dunkirk. Uh, I was struck uh, s several, Kenneth Branagh, uh, his character actually says, you know, you have all these people uh, there, and you get these massive shots of all these people in line, and then he says there are like 300,000 of them, and they're just all sitting ducks, mm -hmm. because it opens uh, with uh, the, um, you know, the, uh, the enemy just strafing and dropping bombs, and you've got no place to go. And so I thought, I, I keep asking myself from war films, uh, and not that I know by any means, uh, shape, or form what it's really like, but I think we all know war is hell. What new are you going to bring to this? And so that's kind of what I was looking for from Dunkirk as a film. I thought there were some tough to say wonderful moments uh, with showing how when a boat is sinking, how these men are drowning uh, and how they can't escape and how things, the tide, no pun intended, turns so quickly for them. So I thought, uh, and then I thought this wrapped up uh, very well. The last 15 minutes or so ties all these disparate stories together. And you, you're right, you, we see Tom Hardy and we think it's just lost for him and how, no, not to give anything away, but th how that pulls out. So I thought ultimately this was an education on uh, a horrific moment in uh, wartime, but also directorally uh, a wonderful step up for Nolan, uh, really as somebody who's working now with, with real full-fledged three-dimensional characters and that's what I liked about, about it. It was it wrapped together and told me how, if I'm looking for something new from this, not just how people died, but how people lived, how people survived. And uh, all of the, not only the, because there's, there's one real poignant moment where uh, all of these uh, civilians who are bringing their boats in and saving uh, all of these soldiers, one of the soldiers said, we, let, we really let you down. And how horrible that must have thought. So I thought this was a terrific character piece. I think I'm going to enjoy this even more actually on home video because I think as broad a spectacle as it is, I think it's going to be better uh, in an intimate, intimate setting. Speaking of war, spectacles and, and war spectacles and 3D. Spectacles and war, uh, it, it's pretty wild. So uh, if, you've, uh, if you're living on an idyllic planet and everything is just peachy keen, but then all of a sudden bad aliens, bad aliens, come uh, to try to take over. There's pretty much only one person you can really hope for, and that would be Valerian. Five, four, three, two, one, showtime! So from so. Luke Besson, the man who gave us, yep. for me it's La Femme Nikita, and okay. he wrote the taxi movies, which sadly nobody still knows here, except <laughs> the crappy remake. Uh, for most people, Luke Besson is the guy who gave you uh, Fifth Element and Lucy, right. which are films I don't really care for. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, so I saw this trailer, and my first thought was, I need to see this as big as possible Holy with moly. as many added gimmicks as possible. Okay. And I ultimately said, I don't want to leave town. I'm going to go to Keen Cinemas. <laughs> but I saw it in 3D, uh, which I think helps. Uh, the space scenes were amazing in 3D. Okay. And it really, as I say, at, at its minimal use or best use, 3D is like stereo. It just draws you more into the world of the film that you're right. watching. And it did do that. Uh, Wow, does this look amazing. Holy cow. And I, and I said also yeah. going in, this movie can suck, but if it's if it's pretty and shows me all <laughs> kinds of neat stuff, I'll probably be okay with it, which may, lead, may be why I thought it was fine. Uh, I thought <laughs> it was fun. It showed me things, uh, some concepts I'd never seen before. It showed me things I'd never seen before, which is uh, more and more important the older I get. 
and uh, it moved right along despite being two hours and 15 yeah, minutes. Yeah, it was long. I don't think I ever really felt like I was getting tired of it or that it was repetitive at any point. Um, I'll let you talk about the cast because my thoughts echo yours. Uh, the effects were amazing. The CGI creatures, still, there's this alien race that this whole film revolves around. Right. And they still felt a little floaty and not really moving realistically. Okay. I guess you could criticize that comment and say, well, how are they supposed to look? Have you seen <laughs> aliens before? To which I would reply, eh, maybe not. Maybe, okay. maybe that's how they should look. Uh, but no, I thought Valerian was a lot of fun. Uh, there's nothing uh, in it that's overtly uh, terrible that uh, wouldn't be decent for kids, I think. There's right. a scene in like a futuristic outer space brothel with Rihanna doing a strip tease that's right. <laughs> saucy but not explicit. Yeah. Uh, but otherwise, I just thought it was kind of it was fun. It's the kind of fun a younger me would have really eaten up at a matinee. And in fact, an older me did actually eat up at a matinee, <laughs> including popcorn. Well, again, PG-13. So yeah, I don't think there's um, much there to, to worry about for the kids. Um, is this fair? I went into it expecting... I guess for want of a better term, a more adult film. I didn't get the idea, I didn't know that our main characters were quite so young. Uh, we've got um, our lead actor who is probably most well known as the Harry Osborne mm -hmm. maybe, although he was in A Cure for Wellness, which we both liked and I like right. him a lot. His uh, female counterpart, I kept getting struck by how young she looked. Now, she'll probably love that 10 years from now, 20 years from now, as unfortunately uh, sexist we are in wanting our actresses to always look young. But uh, I was struck by this, uh, after seeing this, thinking, this is really needs to be more aimed more at kids. Um, I thought the, the, the storyline and the plot, nothing terribly new, although, as you say, in this world that they've created, there are lots of really cool little um, special moments that they make that are just going on in their world. They don't emphasize it. They don't take the camera and say, hey, audience, look at this. Uh, so that's really uh, adult and mature. But uh, ultimately, I think you've got to go to this just to be blown away by the special effects. And, uh, and not that they're in your face special effects. I didn't see this in 3D. I saw it in 2D. I do my best to try to avoid 3D just because most of the time uh, I find it intrusive. But uh, even in 2D, it's just a joy to behold. I thought I didn't get the experience um, finding the aliens difficult to buy. I just thought every moment of it was just stunning and breathtaking. There might have been, and this is us as filmmakers, uh, a couple of moments where I could see them performing in front of the green screen yeah. or something like that. But other than that, um, I'm once again really looking forward to just uh, glorying in this in 4K. This will be a demo um, disc. Yeah, that, yeah that'd be truly terrific. So, yeah, I thought, uh, especially in retrospect, that Valerian, if you go in knowing that it's and this isn't negative, but it's silly. It's sort of a lighthearted space romp. Well, it's based on a 70s French comic that was, I guess, okay, which serialized I didn't know. here in the Heavy Metal magazine. Okay. And for me, it felt a lot, as I'm watching it, like, this is kind of like Barbarella if you did it now <laughs> with a lot of money. Or like those old That's Gamma like that, 1 yeah. movies, the old, like, uh, or Gamma whatever it was, like War Between the Planets, those Italian space movies that were really cheap at the time, but they had the wild costumes and right. sets. This feels like if, you, if those never stopped being made and they evolved <laughs> to this. Right. So I, I enjoyed it on that level, too. Yeah. So, uh, again, I think Valerian... I think was uh, uh, was a good deal of fun. I'll probably enjoy it even more once it comes to video. Speaking of coming to video... Everything's war today, too. What's the uh, deal? Yes, speaking of war, uh, pity the person at the multiplex who wants to see a quiet movie when you have <laughs> battles on both sides of you. Uh, up next is the uh, third and final chapter in the uh, updated saga of uh, Simeon Scintillation. We have uh, Caesar and the gang are back again to duke it out with humans in the war for the Planet of the Apes. The crispy, crunchy chip with a zesty, tantalizing flavor all its own. Okay, that's, so. That's Chimpertainment. Back, uh, once again, it's a war uh, movie. I haven't been, I haven't liked, I haven't disliked the two reboots of this that we saw previously. And so I went into this thinking, okay, uh, more of the same, I guess. And that's what it gave me. Um, uh, another war movie, I, case I, I'm, I keep looking for something new. What this tried to do, and I guess I can respect this, was um, side with the apes and show how, look, the apes are all this community, and here's this invading force. It felt very, uh, I thought it was very topical and um, 
Was it intentionally, you know, commenting on? I would hope so because the original Apes films, when you watch, were very topical sure, of their day, sure. and that's what I kind of like about them. Looking back, right. So, are we talking about uh, the new presidential administration and its xenophobia and all of this? And, and so, the Apes uh, battling against um, Woody Harrelson's represent Woody Harrelson represents humanity, obviously. So it's Caesar versus Woody Harrelson. Um, Andy Serkis needs an Academy Award f for something at yeah. some point in time because he's just so spectacular in this. But for me, I thought uh, I'm following this whole thing along. We spend the first half an hour or so uh, in all of this uh, just kind of, in my opinion, forced family issued, subtitle driven with the apes. You know, Caesar is talking to us, but then few of the other apes will talk. Um, and so they're doing all of this sign language. And I have to read half an hour of subtitles of apes pouring out their heart and their souls. And I'm like, really? I've seen this so many times in other movies. So that really got me off to on a bad All those start. other movies with apes doing sign language with, for well, half You know what I mean. <laughs> and so then we finally get, uh, tune away and I'll call you back if you want in 10 seconds or so. So spoiler alert. But then we finally get to Caesar and, and Woody Harrelson. I forget the characters' names. Um... Confrontation, Kurtz, and uh, probably should have been Kurtz. Yeah. And Harrelson just gives up for some reason. We find him, and he's uh, in bad sorts. I don't want to give too much away, and just kind of gives up. So that didn't make any sense. You can come back if you want. Um, and so in the long run, I, w I didn't find anything new in this Apes. Uh, I thought it was pretty disappointing. Uh, the effects were really quite solid. Um, but other than that, I, I was pretty disappointed in this. Now, I, on the other hand, I love the original Apes films, and when I heard they were doing new ones, I'm like, leave it alone. Right. But I've liked that these are not simply remakes of the original films. I mean, in broad strokes, they kind of are, vaguely, but not really too much. Um, and I, I saw this as part of a triple feature that the studio did, where you could watch all three of these new films ending with the new one. Right. Uh, so it was nice to see those close together because I hadn't before. And there are little, there are characters and places and things that weave through all three that I think I wouldn't have remembered if I had just seen the new one by itself. But that aside, um, I liked this new film. I didn't think it was as good as the previous two, but I still think it was good. Uh, it's much more of a big battle film. And I, I had said before this came out. It doesn't have to do much to be better than Battle for the Planet of the Apes, because that movie was not good. Right. <laughs> that That's the opposite case where the old studio would, would put less and less money into each subsequent sequel. Right. We're going to keep making them, but we're going to make them worse. It right. doesn't make any sense. <laughs> uh, but this this is not the case. So this is well-funded and, and huge in scale. Uh, the CG apes, and again, having watched all three, in the first film, the CG apes exhibit everything I don't like about CGI, which is they don't feel like they're really there. Right. They don't move naturally. They don't feel like they have weight. They kind of float. Uh, in this movie, they look real. Like, there were times where I'm like, did they have a guy in an ape suit and then digitally put a face on it? It looks like it's really there. And even the ape faces at times, I'm like, those look real. I mean, the apes, they look humanoid to a degree. Right. But the, the lip movement was really, really close. To I was it, really impressed. To its merit, mm -hmm. I will give this film um, one big uh, plus for an extremely funny and effective character that they have. There's this one ape that is the comic relief, mm -hmm. and he works really well and is really funny. So very much enjoyed that moment. And I did not expect any kind yeah. of levity in this Comedy movie, in this one, Because yeah. these are he really dark films, and it remains being dark. And again, Andy Serkis' performance in Caesar, the Caesar performance was like riveting yes. and really strong. Uh, there were funny moments, there were little references to the other films, nothing as in the first film that really took me out of it where they start quoting lines and all that stuff. There are a couple things that they do to connect this movie to characters you, you would see in the original Planet of the Apes film from 68. Right. I choose to believe those were just in-jokes and they're not trying to say that this connects to that world. Yeah, I was worried because about Because there that. are certain things that do not happen in the course of this film that, in my mind, well, it can't connect to the old movies. Right. Maybe it'll connect to more movies they make, but let's not do that. Let's right. keep this a separate series. Uh, at any rate, I thought this was really good for me. It made me mm -hmm. happy. And if they don't make any more, that's cool. They made three good ones. And if they do make more, don't screw it up and ruin the goodwill you have out of making the first three Fair good enough. ones. Well, uh, enough with war, although you'll get lots of battle going on with it. Uh, the studios want you to forget about Tobey Maguire. The studios want you to forget about Andrew Garfield. The studios want you to love little Tom Holland. Um, and even though you don't get to see him get bitten again, which is always probably good, in all of the festivities and everything rollicking around his high school, you do get to see uh, and spend some time with Spider-Man's homecoming. Snack bar, where we offer a wide variety of good things to eat and drink to top off your evening. 
Okay, my favorite character in all of comics, uh, even though I worked for the opposing uh, comic book company, uh, I always got in trouble because I had little gadgets and Spider-Man stuff on my desk. So I love Spider-Man, uh, love Tobey Maguire's uh, take on it. I thought he was the perfect Peter Parker. Um, I actually got to liking Andrew Garfield's Spider-Man the uh, second time the around. Second, movie. second yeah. time around, uh, I really liked it. So they would make the perfect two. So uh, I mean, you have to do the comparison. Um, I thought Tom Holland did an acceptable job. If we hadn't had any of the other movies, I probably would have. Uh, he looks a lot like a young uh, Tobey Maguire for good or for bad. So every now and then, I started liking him a little bit. Um, so I kind of went in this with a chip on my shoulder. Um, ultimately, I didn't. I ended up not liking this. They change, uh, and, and I think without reservation or without any logic, they change a lot of the mythos of Spider-Man. Also, what I enjoyed from the first one, and that what really got to the heart of the Spider-Man character, and this is what made uh, Stan Lee's version of Spider-Man back in the in the 60s, in 1961, was Peter Parker was the first superhero with troubles. He had to worry about Aunt May, and he had to worry about paying the rent, and worry about his grades and things like that. So uh, some of the pathos uh, of the first movies, even with Garfield's, uh, was what I was really missing from this. This is a silly, lighthearted version um, aimed at kids, I think. Uh, it aims to be very politically correct. Every single one uh, and I'll get in trouble for this, and I don't mean to be uh, xenophobic, I'll keep using the word. Um, but every single one of Peter's friends is of a different ethnicity. Um, and so that just felt forced politically correct. Um, Tony Stark comes in, and ever since Captain America Civil War, I don't like Iron Man, and I don't like Tony Stark, so that's bad news for me. But um, also, he's the reason, and I guess you have to have a reason to draw people in more. And so Spider-Man's got this suit, that has all sorts of different weird gadgets and things like that. Uh, in my opinion, because Tony Stark gave it to him too, Spider-Man is now a red-suited Iron Man, uh, even though Iron Man has some red on him. And so all of this, and there's even a moment where Peter goes off and does some stuff, and then Tony comes back and says, give me the suit. Um, and uh, uh, Peter Parker says, oh, without the suit, I'm nothing. And Iron Tony Stark says, well, then you don't deserve it. Look who's talking, you blowhard. Um, so anyway, I thought this was not nearly in the pantheon uh, of the other ones. Uh, what I did like was Michael Keaton's Vulture. Yes. Um, I thought he did a really fun job. He even occasionally made me almost side with him, that I could understand why he was going with it. So um, the, the bright star part on this one was Keaton, and I thought Holland did a respectable job. The parts that I didn't like were just the way they kind of, in my opinion, just kind of twisted and messed with... Um, uh, the the Spider-Man history, and I'm okay with reimagining things. But like at the very end, we meet a character named MJ, but her name's Michelle. It's Mary Jane. Come on, yeah. why? And so for people who know Spider-Man, and they're the ones that are going to be seeing this, that's going to stand out. And now you're taking me out of the movie and making me wonder. So ultimately, sorry, I didn't like this one. And for people who don't care about the mythology, it wouldn't bother them if they stayed true to it. Yeah, if they, if they, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I ultimately didn't love it either. It was okay for me, but for me, the big thing uh, in an action movie is action. And why can't we ever... See I'm going to do it. Effing see action in a movie anymore. <laughs> um, there's a scene that you see in the trailer where he's, he's beating up some bad guys who are trying to rob an ATM. And it should be fun and exciting and clever, but it is such a flurry of cuts and shaking camera, I'm like... I guess Spider-Man beat them all up. I see glimpses of what was probably clever choreography and how he did that. Should I have been shown that, I probably would have liked the movie. And that happens repeatedly in this film. Yeah. It's just cut way too fast and sloppily. And I'm like, why? Like the whole opening of the movie is supposed to be shot on Peter Parker's cell phone. And it looks like crap. <laughs> why do we do this? Uh, movies ain't cheap to make and they ain't cheap to go see. Yeah. And why do you throw the visuals away like that? Um, I didn't really care about uh, the, the Peter Parker in this movie. He was just kind of a aw shucks, Mr. Stark, whatever. Right. Uh, I, I was sick of hearing about Iron Man and the Avengers in this movie. We yep. didn't need that. Yeah, sick of the it Avengers. It was distracting. Uh, I didn't care about any of his classmates. The actors were not very uh, likable or, or um, personable to me. The, the, the comedy relief friend was annoying, and I'm mm -hmm. sick of every superhero needing a support team. We don't right. need that. <laughs> Uh, I used to refer to it with Smallville. Yeah, his suit talking to him and all yeah, that. Yeah, stupid. You know, all this other just again, this is all just like distractions from what should just yeah. be a fun movie. What I will say, uh, thrilled that we didn't have to have an origin story yep, in this film you. at all, <laughs> at all. It's just like everybody knows who Spider-Man is. Let's just get on with it. Uh, one villain, mm -hmm. that's nice. 
Uh, as far as other superheroes, I don't want them there, but there was only one. It wasn't like Civil War, which was essentially an Avengers movie. Right. Um, and it was it was not uh, two and a half hours long. So that was all good. So right. like, like with Iron Man 2, which I didn't like, I'm like, okay, keep making these. Just kind of make them better. Right. So hopefully they will be better, and uh, we'll see. Speaking of hopefully, yes. hopefully I'll come up with an intro to this between mm. now and when I start talking okay. again. Uh, up next is a film uh, in limited release now. I know it's at the uh, Brattle Theater in Boston for you, those of you in the New England area, but it is also opening slowly across the country. Uh, we have an autobiography of sorts of the uh, South American, I believe, filmmaker Alejandro Jodorowsky, and uh, it is about his life growing up in a world that is not so amenable to the art which he has inside him, and he finds that when you find yourself with the right people and the right set of mind, the world can be filled with endless poetry. No showtime treat to equal the crisp, delicious flavor of hot popcorn that's bathed in real melted butter. So not a film for everybody. <laughs> uh, people may or may not know uh, Hodorowsky. He did a film called El Topo and Holy Mountain, which were really, and Santa Sangre. Uh, big time, like midnight movie movies, very mm -hmm. avant garde, strange, artistic, bizarre. Uh, this is really an auto biopic of, of him where he's talking about really basically life from a youth until he finally left his home country to go off and pursue a career as a poet. So you see him, you know, fighting with his father who is very, you need to be a doctor. This is it's this basically being a poet or an artist is going to make you a homosexual and all this other stuff repeatedly. And, and basically, Horowski finds his, finds his people and okay. he finds uh, this community of artists. And it's, it's very strange. It's done, uh, Horowski himself as an 80-something-year-old man narrates it and is in the film talking to his younger self. Uh, you see, some like a train will go by, but it's a giant cardboard cutout of a train. So it's very oddly done. At times, it feels like it's done as a stage play. Like you see people entirely clad in black in the corners of the screen, but intentionally there, so you can see them like moving props or handing somebody a prop, which is kind of funny and kind of odd. Okay, um, it is very funny at times. It is sad at times. There are some very interesting visuals and bizarre. Uh, you get the full gamut of male and female nudity if, 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 if you are interested in that sort of thing. Although not really done in a, in a salacious way, just as done in a, this is what people look like without their clothes on. Uh, I, I liked it overall. I think you probably need to be predisposed to liking uh, Horowski's films or have seen some other ones maybe, or like weirdo art movies. <laughs> uh, this is not one for the mall crowd. Uh, but I think if, if you like his films or are open to a little adventure, it's worth seeking out. Uh, I think it speaks to anybody who has an artistic bent, who was perhaps uh, not finding a whole lot of familial, familial or uh, friend support in that in their younger years, because that's basically his story. And ultimately a little sad, because it's, it's him looking back on his life and telling his younger self, you're going to regret having done what you just did right there, <laughs> and stuff like that. So uh, it was very interesting, I thought. Okay. Uh, endless poetry out in theaters now. Okay, we're good. And that's all that we are discussing that is in theaters currently. Yep. We thank our friends at the Latches Theater Absolutely. in Brattleboro, Vermont, for being a cool old theater. And Thanks, for Darren. Sponsoring, thanks for sponsoring this program. <laughs> oh, by, you know, you walk in the door, you look at the, at the floor. The floor right. is impressive in that place. Oh, yeah, it's fun. On the fountains and all that. Uh, and then we now move on to that which you might choose or not to watch on the home video platform of your choice. However, they get there. And you could start... Uh, you can do it anytime, actually, if you want. Uh, but you could start with uh, a tale. Maybe you've seen this before. I think I have, too. But uh, give it a chance. Uh, at least check out the trailer. Uh, where a group of scientists travel off to a, a strange and unusual place where they've uh, suspected, actually, they've lost some comrades, and they have to find them. And they run into uh, dawn of prehistoric era and one big, huge uh, ape kind of guy uh, we've had wars for the Planet of the Apes, but this might well take place on Kong, Skull Island. Twelve monkeys in a chain, and you're the champ. Nothing's more fun than a barrel of monkeys. There's a drive way back. Yes. And watching his head go. Um, so, once again, uh, why? Uh, what's new? We've, we've seen Kong done many, many times. So, what's new? I think um, what's new is probably, again, the state of the special effects. Um, most of them, I didn't. I, I thought Kong looked really good. I didn't think a lot of the other creatures looked so all that good. Um, uh, I was entertained by. I like Brie Larson. Uh, I like Tom Hiddleston. Uh, so they were. They drove it pretty well for me. But I've seen this all uh, time and time again. Um, 
I'll let you let us know why, in many respects, this came out, because uh, I get the sense that we're going to see uh, others of them based on uh, what the uh, producers can do and to what they have the rights. But uh, I didn't think there was anything new. I didn't think it was bad. Kind of eh, so-so on Kong. Um, I didn't like it because, uh, again, the action was hard to see. Right. Um, very often, there'd be these brief moments where the, some of the action would hold for a few more frames so you could catch a pose. And it felt, it felt like if you could do a bunch of frame grabs or get the concept art from this movie, it would make like a great storybook version <laughs> of the story if you pared it way down. Because it, it clearly seemed like da 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 blur, and then oh, that's what the storyboard artist came up with. <laughs> um, really hacky use of music. You know, yeah. music dropped in for two seconds. Run through the jungle because they're going to Vietnam in the jungle. Um, and, and just a lot of it was just hard to see and follow. It's a shame because when I describe what happens in the movie to somebody, it sounds like exactly the kind of movie I would like. And then I go, no, wait a minute, I didn't like it I while didn't I was like watching this. it. Yeah. Um, Legendary Pictures, who did the previous uh, hard-to-watch Godzilla movie in yeah. America, uh, has the rights to the Toho Monsters and King Kong. Oh, so, so there you go. If you fast forward to the end of this movie, I don't want to give it away, there's a scene that sets up the fact that eventually th this is leading to a King Kong versus Godzilla movie. Everybody's like, oh my god, I can't wait for, finally we're going to see King Kong fight Godzilla. And I'm like, or you could have been around in the 60s when that was <laughs> done already. Right. Guys in suits, so yes, it'll be arguably be more impressive now if they shoot it and cut it so we can see it. Uh, but yeah, I didn't like uh, Kong Skull Island despite it being in theory ideally suited for me. I just thought it was really cheesy and, and hacky and hard to watch. Fair enough. Well, if we're talking about huge spectacles and all sorts of things blowing up, this isn't going to be your film. Um, looking for a, a little history about uh, golf, wondering what exactly happened there on St. Andrews, and uh, we've got a story about uh, one of the first groundskeepers at St. Andrews and his son, who wants to be a professional golfer. It's all going to um, build up, and you're going to see a lot of praise for Tommy's honor. No, 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 no way. I'm not paying you. This is ridiculous. So Sam Neill, the big quote-unquote American um, actor, he's the big draw name in this. He's not in it a lot. He's one of the guys who, what I found a little confusing with this, and this is based on a true story, um, was you start early on, and if you're not super familiar with golf, uh, you see these people who are playing, and then the rich people around there, they're not playing themselves. They're betting on these golfers. Oh, I think Tommy will beat everybody else. Um, but you don't learn that. Uh, so I found, I found the beginning and the build-up uh, rather confusing, trying to figure out who the characters were. Um, it's a story that we've heard before. Uh, certainly, you know, the, the young kid who is, uh, you know, in a family, and he, uh, it's the social uh, stratus class issue, and so he tries to pull himself up from his bootstraps and be the best that he can be. Um, so we've heard that before. I think you're going to like this if you like golf a lot and if you're interested in the history. The lead actor, the guy who plays young Tommy, is terrific. Uh, he's really, really good. Um, and so I think this is going to appeal. Uh, it's directed by Jason Connery, Sean Connery's oh, really? son. I didn't know he directed. He's done a couple of movies. Um, this is certainly his best, I think. I wasn't crazy about his early ones, but I think, you know, you got to learn. you got to get some things. And so I think he's really coming of his own in that respect. So um, uh, I just had to give uh, this one a little push because it's based on a best-selling book that was written by my brother. Oh, that's and fantastic. And he, he and his wife wrote the screenplay. So I wanted to give a little hype there. Well, good for them. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, does this film feature the all-important uh, facet of high-octane uh, motor vehicle mayhem? Uh, and you don't get a lot of punching around or anything like that no, either, so um, it's well. not on big sheets of ice. So, yeah. But you can find that where? Um, oh, should I? You should. Why heck? You may. Uh, Vin Diesel and the gang, or it's about family, are back once again to do impossible things with cartoon cars in Fate with a fair start button and a finish date where you finish with flying colors. Chase movie. Hi. Talking and about back. something totally different. Yes, absolutely nothing you? to do with you. Right. Anyway, I didn't see this. Okay, well, um... I, I'm okay. So I'm a sucker for some of these early ones. The, I like the first couple. Um, it, it's been interesting to me how they can continue it going on. There's always one little cute little twist. As much as I don't like these, I'm impressed that this series has not been the same thing eight yeah, times. Yeah, uh, eight times, and it hasn't been. Um, this brings everybody back. Um, we have a, a wonderful lead actress who is this evil villainess. Um, I ended up, we'll, we'll kind of cut to the chase. Uh, if 
it looks like fun. You're going to get what you paid for. You, you get what you see in the trailer. Uh, if you're a fan of the earlier ones, I think this tops it all off. It, certainly they can continue these, but I think this would be a great way to end it. Um, I really thought uh, the eighth one, Fate of the Furious, was a lot of fun for what it wanted to be. Speaking for what it wants to be, yes. I'm going to move right along because we're short on time. Uh, here we have a new release of an old film, uh, courtesy of the folks at the American Genre Film Archive, AGFA, not to be confused with the film company, of a film that was made with the specific intent of catching a serial killer. Here we have from the early 70s, made while the murders were still happening, the Zodiac Killer. I just like the way girls like Zodiac. Nestle Zodiac milk chocolate. <laughs> So um, I would highly advise anybody to go online and find a recent Entertainment Weekly article about the making of, about not the making, about the release of this movie. Okay. Because to me, this, the release of this movie makes, knowing that it makes this viewing experience more interesting, and it is also, frankly, more interesting than the film is. Um, <laughs> it's a very cheap, low-budget, quickly knocked out movie uh, made in the San Francisco Bay Area when the Zodiac Killer was still on the loose doing his thing out there. And the director made this with the idea that the Zodiac Killer might come to a screening of it because he was a glory hound and they might be able to catch him in the theater. Okay. Again, read the article because there's a really wild uh, story of the contraptions and the machinations they, machinations they went into to try to catch the guy if he showed up. The movie itself is pretty cheap and, and kind of bad on many levels. Um, because it was happening when the story was still unfolding, you had some accurate recreations of what had just recently happened and some total fantasy. You have Doodles Weaver, for what that's worth, uh, and you have some just silly comedy moments, too. Uh, overall, it's probably for fans of, of cheap B-movies and cheap horror movies because it is cheap and laughable most of the time. <laughs> a couple moments I thought were effective, but otherwise it's, it's kind of a... Kind of a throwaway little nugget for a Friday night with friends, I think. Okay. Um, speaking of nuggets with friends, it's time to quickly go to the Arrow Video Corner, which I know you've missed so much, low these many weeks. Uh, we are talking about a film starring Mr. Sonny Chiba, who people know from the uh, Street Fighter films and many other action movies. We talked about his uh, Arrow release of Wolf Guy a couple weeks ago. Here we have... Oh, there we are. Here's Sonny Chiba starring as a, you, a bumpkin time. cop who comes to the big city to help solve some murders. And he is known by a certain name, and those who meet his wrath know why he is called the Doberman Cop. <laughs> So, you know, this is one, really, gather the family around for this one. Yes, exactly. Uh, so it's another Sonny Chiba from the same era, sort of, as Wolf Guy and his other films. So you're talking about early, mid-70s, uh, maybe later, I could be wrong. And it is funky. Uh, the, it, it's got the Waka Chicka soundtrack. It's got the uh, Dutch angles, the really cool camera moves, and, and a lot of style. It was reminiscent to me of Lethal Weapon in a way. Like, I almost wonder if it was influenced in any way because you have this guy who's coming into an area with all the police to, or by the book. And when we don't was know this how to, made, though? Uh, Mid-70s, I think. Because wasn't Lethal Weapon in the early 87, 80s? 87, I want to say okay. the first one was. And, uh, like, there's a scene where he's rappelling down the side of a building and crashes through a window and takes out a bad guy while the bad guy's holding somebody hostage and the police are on the other side of the oh, door. Okay, right. He just takes <laughs> these renegade methods. He hops on a dirt bike. He's knocking people down. Um, it, it's funny because he shows up with like a straw hat barefoot with a pig under his arm. <laughs> and so it's almost like hee-haw with a cop. Uh, but it, it's, it's sleazy and it's funky and it's wild and weird. And I really liked it a lot. So I think if you like 70s cop movies, if you're not afraid of subtitles, um, Arrow, again, has a great presentation of it. So it looks and sounds fantastic. You've got a nice long Sonny Chiba career interview, like a part one or part two, I think, on this and uh, a lot of stuff with the creative team who were behind it. So I really enjoyed Doberman Cop. I love that Arrow was putting out a lot of these 70s funky Japanese cop movies. I like them. They're unlike a lot of what I've seen before or since, so that's like my niche, so to speak. Okay. So uh, I liked Doberman Cop. So there. Great. Um, so we will be back next week. We will be back. Talking about only Atomic Blonde. two new movies. <laughs> or maybe only one new Looks movie. Like maybe only one. Who knows? We'll see how it goes. <laughs> and uh, I can guarantee plenty of video titles to talk about as they've been stacking up. Thanks to him. Thanks to me. All me. So, uh, until then, I'm Mark. And I'm Tom. And we are the, the Cinemaniacs. Cinemaniacs.